Okay, welcome. Uh, so today we'll continue with the discussing relativistic kinematics. And one of the things we uh, were concerned with in the previous lecture was to find a generalization of Newton's second law to the relativistic regime. So we wanted to find some generalization which would both satisfy this requirement of covariance so that it would have the same form in all inertial systems and in addition that satisfy the criteria of reducing to the non-relativistic uh, standard form of Newton's second law that we're familiar with in the case where the velocity would be small compared to the speed of light. And uh, what we proposed should do the trick was the following equation, where this was the Minkowski force, this is the eigentime, which is the Lorentz invariant, and this is the four velocity vector. So we had identified this Minkowski force So I have the following form. <coughs> so it has this additional gamma factor due to the relativistic direction, and here we have the usual force. And then the fourth component associated with the time dimension in Minkowski space has this particular form. Now, using these two equations, we considered in particular the fourth component to derive the following. So we derive the following result considering the fourth component of this generalized Newton's second law upon defining the energy in the following way. <coughs> so this result should reduce to the non-relativistic case when the velocity is much smaller than the speed of light. But at the same time, this looks perhaps a bit strange, non-familiar. This is something you probably haven't seen before in the non-relativistic case. So let's see what happens. So let's consider what this energy now reduces to in the non-relativistic case of beta much smaller than 1. So we have we have the following expansion of the root where I've used that The following expansion can be done. Uh, 
And then I use the following to transform this expression to this. So it follows that the energy, the relativistic result here in the non-relativistic limit has two contributions. The first contribution is just this term, mc squared. And then we have the following term. And this is familiar. This is just the kinetic energy associated with a particle. But we see then that we have gained an extra term here compared to the standard non-relativistic calculations that we are accustomed to. And that is precisely this constant mc squared, which has a very specific interpretation. Namely, it's the energy associated with the mass of the particle. Also known as the rest energy, because this is an energy the particle has even if it's not moving. So it's an intrinsic property of matter, whereas this is the kinetic energy. So as a consequence of this, these relativistic considerations, we see that matter should have an intrinsic energy associated with it, even when it's not moving. And this is the so-called rest energy of a particle, for instance. And as we will see in detail in just a little while, this rest energy is very important, in fact, when you want to calculate um, what happens for different particle collisions. So you want to set up the sort of balance between energy and momentum for particle collisions so that you have conserved quantities. Well, to, to make this right, you have to take into account this rest energy of the particles. So we'll see more about this in just a little while. So uh, with the aim of that we should be able to analyze these particle collisions, it's useful to say something about the transformation properties of the four momentum vector. So let me just remind you that the four momentum can be defined like this, where this is the relativistic momentum, including the gamma factor. You can also write this in the following way, if you like. So let's have a look now at how this p mu, this four momentum vector, transforms between variant, uh, various inertial systems. In other words, how does it behave under Lorentz transformation?
Well, it follows from its definition, which consists of two Lorentz invariants, this mass and the eigentime, that it, sh it should transform exactly like the four position vector. And this is known. We, we know how the four position vector transforms between various inertial systems, namely via the Lorentz transformation. So in other words, If you just consider the normal convention that we've been using so far, where the velocity is uh, parallel with the z-axis, and you then imagine the following scenario, that the four momentum vector in one inertial system is known, namely p mu, then you can find the four momentum vector in any other inertial system moving relative our original system in the following way, just by using the Lorentz transformation matrix. So the first two components of the four momentum vector remain invariant, just as for the four position vector. However, the component of the four momentum vector along the relative motion, uh, the relative, the direction which, where we have the relative motion and the time coordinates are not invariant. So for instance, for the third component of the four momentum in this new inertial system, we should take the third row of this Lorentz matrix multiplied with the known four momentum vector. So we get gamma P3 and I beta gamma P4, like this. Now this is the general definition of the four momentum vector. So P4 can be expressed through the energy of the particle. P4 is I, E over C, multiplied with this, gives us that coefficient. Similarly, we get the following equation from the transformation of the fourth component. <coughs> so the fourth component is IE prime over C equals this. So this is an important point, namely the energy of the particle is different comparing, um, when comparing different inertial systems. This might seem like an obvious thing, but uh, it's good to be aware of, because we're, we're used to thinking of energy as a conserved quantity, right? And it is, but we have to be careful to take into account also the rest energy of the particles. 
to make this balancing um, correct. So we'll see a, an example of this in just a little bit. So we have this equation and So we can rewrite this in the following way, which expresses the energy of the particle as seen in the moving inertial systems through the energy of the particle in the stationary system. And also it depends on the relative velocity of the two inertial systems and the momentum P3 of the particle along the direction of relative motion. So you see here that E prime and E are in general not the same. So what kind of consequences does this have? Well, we could ask what is really the invariant quantity here? Because we see here that the energy apparently seems to be expressed differently in the two inertial systems. Now, we know that we can make an invariant quantity by taking the scalar product of two four vectors. So if you recall, for instance, x mu x mu, is an invariant. So anything that transforms like x mu should also be an invariant. It should have the same value in all inertial systems. So in other words, we should have a p mu p mu, the scalar product between two four vectors, the four momentum vectors, should also be an invariant. It should have the same value in both of these inertial systems. <coughs> so let's try to calculate this. And the nice thing about these invariants is that precisely because they have the same value in all inertial systems, we can calculate their universal value in the most convenient reference system. We can just choose the reference system where this quantity is the most simple to evaluate. And then we know that this will be the value in all inertial systems. So, uh, if you were given the task of evaluating this scalar product, which inertial, systems, uh, inertial system would you choose to find its value in? So let me rephrase, you have a particle moving. Which reference system would you choose to evaluate the four momentum of this particle in. The co-moving one? The co-moving one. Co one, where the particle is at rest, you mean? Yeah. Okay, so why would you make that choice? Because then you don't have to worry about the force component of the vector. Um, the fourth component is the energy. Yeah, yeah, and the other three components are at zero. Right, okay. So, okay, so you mean we, we can just disregard the first three components, exactly. So what he's saying is that if we choose some, a reference system which is moving with the particle, for instance, attached to the particle, then the first three components of the momentum four vector are just zero. So that's pretty easy. So we only have to worry about the fourth component. So we get...
We get this general expression, right? So in our specific, for our choice of reference system, this is zero. So we get this. Now, the energy, as we've seen, of the particle consists of two terms. It's the kinetic energy and the rest energy of the particle. So if it's not moving, it has zero kinetic energy, but it still has this intrinsic rest energy. So this should be Oh, sorry. We should have this. So by now we're done. We know what the value of this invariant is in any inertial system. It's equal to minus the rest mass squared multiplied with the speed of uh, light squared. And this is a Lorentz invariant quantity. The mass is the same. Okay, so we know the value of this, but we also know the general expression for this scalar product. We know that from its definition, from the definition of the four momentum, it's given like this p uh, three vector p squared minus energy squared over c squared. So this suggests that we should have a general relation And this is a pretty important result. It gives you a relation between the mass, the energy, and the momentum of the particle in any inertial system. Now, what's invariant here is the speed of light, as we know, and also the mass of the particle. And therefore, we see that depend we can have different combinations of energy and momentum, which fulfills this equation. So th this can change depending on which inertial systems we're in. So for instance, in the reference system where, which is moving with the particle, the momentum is zero. And then we have one specific value for the energy. But in another system, say a stationary system where the particle is moving, then P is non-zero, and hence the energy of the particle as we see it is different from the rest system of the particle. So, uh, and this applies to massless particles as well. Do we know of any massless particles? I bet you do. Photons? Photons, excellent. So photons have zero mass, and hence from this general equation, the energy of the photon should just be equal to its momentum multiplied with C. But for photons, we also know, or we have a different expression for its momentum.
We name we have p is equal to h nu, where h is Planck's constant and nu is the frequency of light, which, these, um, which consists of these photons. So in other words, we have the following relation between the momentum of the photon and its wavelength. Since the frequency and the wavelength um, are related through the speed of light by their product. And this is the sorry. This is the Broglie formula. And you can generalize this to other particles if you want, where you say that this is the De Broglie wavelength, which can be calculated from the momentum of the particle. So this is just an example of how you can apply this formula. Okay, so we're going to have a look at a couple of examples of how you can use this general uh, equation here relating the energy, mass, and momentum of a particle, and also the conservation of energy and momentum to analyze particle collisions. So we'll consider just a pretty simple example to begin with. We have two particles with identical masses, small m, which are incident towards each other with equal but oppositely directed velocities. So this is the before situation, and we assume that when they collide, they form this new particle with a mass large m, which is at rest. So what kind of reference system are we using here? Any thoughts? <clears throat> what is the momentum of all the particles in the system here? What is the total momentum here? Zero. Zero. And here? Zero. Zero. So this means that we're operating in the center of mass system where the total momentum is zero. So this is a general uh, thing to keep in mind, possibly, that the center of mass system is often very beneficial for performing the actual calculations, because it means that the total momentum is zero, which simplifies the four momentum vector a lot. Okay, so this is a COM system. And uh, we should have a conservation of energy and a conservation of momentum. So how can we express this now via our four momentum vector? Well, we have
following form for the four momentum vector. So this is the total four momentum vector. In other words, this is um, This is equal to the sum of the four momentum vectors of these two particles, which I named one and two, but it's also equal to this four momentum vector. Because we see that from this general form, that if we have a conserved four momentum vector, then we also have automatically conserved momentum and energy. So if this is preserved, then momentum has to be preserved and energy has to be preserved. So in other words, the sum of the four momentum vectors here has to be equal to this four momentum vector. And this accounts for both energy and momentum conservation. So let's see what happens in this particular situation. So before the collision, we have this. P1 plus P2 is equal to the total four momentum. So it looks up like this. But since we are, have now conveniently chosen the center of mass system, we can immediately conclude that this is zero. Because the sum of all momenta in the central mass system is equal to zero, by definition. And After the collision, well, the particle is at rest, so again we have zero momentum. And we have I large m c as the fourth component. Because if it's at rest, then the energy is just m c squared. So we get this. So now the conservation of the fourth component here provides us with provides us with this. I'm oh, sorry, like this. So we get the following. So you see here that if you know the masses of the initial particles, small m, then the mass of the result, the product, this large particle m, which has been produced in the collision, 
is provided by this equation, where gamma now is the gamma factor associated with this velocity of the particles. So if this is the case, we have that the mass of the product has to be greater than or equal to the sum of the initial particles. In other words, we can actually end up with a heavier particle than the combined mass of the initial particles. So, how can this make sense? We start out with a given mass, and we end up with something that is heavier. So what do you think? Well, the clue here is that there's an equivalence between energy and mass, precisely because of this rest energy term that the particles have. The rest energy is their mass multiplied with c squared. So this implies that there's an energy contained in the very fact that they have mass. So as you collide these particles and sort of integrate them into one combined mass, well, this has to contain both the contribution from the initial kinetic energy of the particles and the rest energy associated with their masses. So in other words, the reason for why this mass is greater than 2m is that it has also absorbed the kinetic energy of the particles. In the special case where gamma is equal to 1, well then, the mass of the final product is just equal to the mass of the two initial particles. But if they have finite velocity, which they, which they should have as they collide, the mass of the final product is in fact greater than the mass of the initial particles because it also absorbs the kinetic energy. This is possible precisely because of the equivalence between the energy, between uh, energy and mass. So we have a mass increase during this reaction. And the reason for why we have a mass increase is that the initial kinetic energy before the collision has been converted into a rest energy, which is equivalent to mass. So there's, no, there's nothing uh, suspicious about energy being converted between different forms. This we know. We can have, for instance, the potential energy of a ski jumper being converted to kinetic energy as he takes off. So this is the way to understand why we have a mass increase. Kinetic energy is converted to a different form of energy, namely rest energy, and the rest energy is associated with the mass of the particle. Okay, uh, we're going to have a look at a couple of more examples, but I think this is a natural point to take a break. So I'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>